Hi, welcome back. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about molecular phylogeny today. So let's begin, shall we? What is a phylogeny? A phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a group of entities. They could be species, individuals, or genes. As it is a tree-like diagram, a phylogeny is also termed a phylogenetic tree. Here is an example of a phylogenetic tree for humans and several primates. Usually, a phylogenetic tree includes several external nodes which represent the taxa in which you are interested and internal nodes which represent the hypothetical common ancestor. The branching pattern represents the evolutionary relationships among taxa. Finally, the root of the tree is the most recent common ancestor for all taxa. As an example, you can draw a family tree for yourself. Here are your grandparents, your parents and your uncle. The two terminal nodes are your brother and yourself. It is interesting that in this family tree, the position of your brother and you can be switched without changing the topology of the tree. It means you can rotate the branches freely in phylogenetic trees. Here are two phylogenetic trees. Are these two trees equal? Can you transform one into each other just by rotating their branches? Look, one, two, three. Okay, now you get it. There are two kinds of phylogenetic trees. The left one has a root, which is the oldest node in the tree. You can find the direction of evolution along the time axis from top to bottom. The right one, however, is an unrooted tree. That is, it only shows the relationships among taxa, but tells us nothing about the evolutionary direction. Why is the root so important for the phylogenetic tree? In this example, we have an unrooted tree consisting of four species, i.e. a human, a chimpanzee, a mouse, and a bird. If you place the root on different positions on the branch, you will get quite different phylogenetic trees Obviously, the tree is critical for the right interpretation of evolutionary relationships. Now, let us talk about the branch length. There are three different types of tree-like diagram. In the left, the branch length is equal for all taxa and have no meaning. This type of tree is called a cladogram. In the middle, the branch length represents the amount of genetic change. This is a phylogram. And in the right, the branch length means evolutionary time. And this tree is a chronogram. So when you read a tree-like diagram, it is necessary to know what the branch length means. Phylogenetic trees can be inferred from phenotypic characters. For example, in this tree, you can find some landmark characters along the evolution of animalia. However, in some cases, Phenotypic characters do not work. For example, here are some different lineages of the COV virus from different hosts. The phenotypes of the virus are highly similar, and it is difficult to collect enough character data to infer their evolutionary relationships. Instead, we can construct its phylogenetic tree using molecular data, in this case, the protein sequences. Here is another example. How can we construct the tree of life for all the living species across the world? Phenotypic characters are largely not comparable among bacteria, fungi, plants and animals. But we can construct this tree using the sequence of a small molecule, i.e. the 16SR RNA. Molecular data have several advantages for phylogenetic construction. For example, each site can be used as a character, and the number is enormous, as all species share the common set of nucleotides. They are highly comparable and unambiguous. In addition, many variations at the DNA sequence level do not translate into protein variation. Thus, these variations are selective neutral and may tell us some information on their evolutionary history. How to construct a molecular phylogeny? In this section, I will show you how to construct a molecular phylogeny step-by-step. Step. 
Generally, there are five steps. Step one, choosing your study species and markers. Which species should be included in my research and which molecular markers should I use? Well, it depends on your scientific question, doesn't it? For example, if you are interested in the macroevolutionary patterns of the kingdom Animalia, you should collect your samples across the whole range and use a relatively conserved marker like 16R RNA, or you can just study the evolutionary relationships among different species in primates. You can choose a medium conserved marker like ITS or COI. It is notable that an outgroup is often necessary if you want to construct a rooted tree. An outgroup is a taxon that is closely related to but beyond the group being studied. For example, I am interested in the evolutionary pattern among B, C, and D. These are the in-group taxa being studied. A, related taxon, A can be used as an outgroup. That is step two. You should get some data. Usually there are DNA sequences. If the samples are novel, you need to sequence your samples in your lab or by a commercial company. Also, you can download some data from a public database like NCBI. Step three, the sequence data must be aligned to find homologous sites, which can be used as characters for phylogenetic construction. If the sequences are similar, the result of the alignment seems clean and clear. There are only a few variable sites but if the sequences are highly divergent, the result of alignment seems a mess. It is difficult to find homologous characters. In that case, you may consider using another, more conserved marker or use protein sequence. Step four. Once your sequences are aligned, you can use different methods to construct your tree. I will provide more details in the later section. The final step is to assess the reliability of your result. Remember that the phylogenetic tree is a statistical hypothesis for evolutionary history. Just like p-value, there are some statistical parameters as an indicator of reliability for the phylogenetic tree. I will provide more details in the later section. Thank you very much for listening. I shall see you again soon.